Well, this evening, I just want to um, continue reading um, in 1 Thessalonians. We essentially read the chapter uh, 4 uh, this morning, uh, this evening. I'd like to read at least the first 11 verses of uh, chapter 5. And uh, I know we might be tempted as I read this to think about all the uh, uh, eschatology, all the, the end, end times, because essentially that's what these two passages are about. But what we're really focusing on here this morning was, um, well, what happens when Jesus comes, how he brings with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. They are with him. And how we will likely be with him before he comes, but if not, we'll meet them in the air. Uh, now, this evening, we're going to talk about that coming again, but again, not from just dealing with the coming, but rather how this calls, or how Paul used this to call the Thessalonian believers to encourage one another and build one another up in that particular instance, but it's something we ought to be doing in all different areas, okay? So, 1 Thessalonians 5, let me read for you verses 1 through 11. And again, referring back to the coming of Jesus, it says this, Now, as to the times and epochs, brethren, you have no need of anything to be written to you, for you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. While they are saying peace and safety, then destruction will come upon them suddenly like labor pains upon a woman with child, and they will not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day would overtake you like a thief. For you are all sons of light and sons of day. We are not of night nor of darkness. So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us be alert and sober. For those who sleep do their sleeping at night, and those who get drunk get drunk at night. But since we are of the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we will live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build up one another just as you also are doing. May the Lord bless his word again to our hearing this evening. Now, as I mentioned already, we saw uh, this morning Paul encouraging us that when our loved ones die in the Lord, we don't uh, have to grieve. I mean, we do grieve because certainly we miss them, but we don't grieve as others who have no hope because we have hope. We know that those who die in the Lord Jesus Christ have fallen asleep in the Lord Jesus. Uh, the scripture often refers to them not as, as dying, but rather as sleeping, uh, because essentially they are sleeping until the Lord returns. But remember, that only refers to the body, not to the soul. The Lord takes their souls to heaven, and in heaven they are more blessed than they have ever been in their entire existence. And as we were reminded this morning, one day we also have the hope that we will see them again, either if the Lord should come during our lifetime or when we enter into that heavenly place uh, with them when we fall asleep in the Lord Jesus, which we were also reminded this morning for all of us, regardless of how old we are, is going to be but a very short time, which is why we need to be ready for that. Well, Paul goes on in this section to tell us um, that when Jesus does come, it's also going to be for something else. It's going to be to judge the unbelievers for their sins. When they think everything is fine, he's going to bring judgment on them suddenly, and he says they will not escape. Now, we don't want to focus on that this evening, although if we don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, we should certainly focus on that because that's what's going to happen to us unless we trust him. But Paul is using this to basically contrast their experience with our experience. Ours is considerably different. This is not what the Lord has planned for us, not wrath. Rather, um, he has planned life. Now, that is what we deserved when we were outside of Christ, and that's another reason why Paul brings this up, is so we can remember what we were and we can be thankful but he's not bringing judgment upon us now that we are in 
the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, Paul writes in verses 9 and 10, For God has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we will live together with Him. Uh, by the way, Paul says here that he has destined us to obtain salvation. Uh, he's not saying that we aren't already saved if we're trusting in Jesus. We just need to understand salvation is a broader term. It refers to being saved. Uh, you, you know, we have been saved, we are being saved, and we will be saved in the future. And when Jesus comes in the future, he will save us from that wrath that he's bringing on the others. So realizing we have this change of relationship, realizing what Jesus is coming uh, to do, what should we do? Well, rather than being afraid of His coming, um, basically uh, being afraid of what He's already given us, His Son, to free us from, He says in verse 8 that we should essentially do three things. We should be sober. We should put on the breastplate of faith and love. And as a helmet, the hope of salvation. Now, when Paul uses terms like this, he's talking about spiritual armor um, and what these things might mean. We realize this is open to a variety of uh, interpretations of different understandings. But I think we could interpret this, uh, that he means at least this, that we should try to see things as they are as the Word of God tells us they are, to be sober-minded, not to be intoxicated by the world or diverted by the world or so absorbed by the world, but that we should be awake and alert and see things as they are, that we should trust in the Lord's promises to us in the Lord Jesus Christ, and that would be not only the promise that we'll be delivered and saved when He comes again, but all of His promises, that we should hope in the grace that He's going to show us on that day or on the day we fall asleep in the Lord Jesus Christ. And in that sobriety, in that trust, in that hope, press on to do what the Lord has called us to do. I believe that Paul was encouraging the Thessalonians that they needed to be about their Lord's work while they're waiting for Jesus to return. And that can be summarized by love, to love Him and to love our neighbor. Now, he also tells us in verse 11 that we should try and help each other to do these same things. He says, therefore, encourage one another and build up one another just as you also are doing. I want you to notice that Paul, as he gives the command, encourage and build up, he also points out encouragement to them. You are already doing this, so keep doing it. And I think it's, it's very important to see that because it gives us a sense of the kind of spirit the Lord wants us to have as we approach these kinds of things of encouraging and building up and so forth, uh, that we are uh, not doing it, obviously, to injure or to tear down. Paul didn't say, you're not doing good enough, do better. But he says, you're doing it, but I want you to excel still more. There's that encouragement, you see, that comes with what he is saying. Now, what Paul told the Thessalonians really applies just as much today as it did then because the Lord still hasn't come, we're still waiting for Him, and we're still to be about our, our Lord's work. So we need these things as well. We need encouragement. We need to build one another up in the Lord Jesus. We need to be a strength and support to one another. Uh, not only in, in the reality of the comfort that we have for our loved ones that we saw this morning, not only in the reality of, of the Lord's coming to judge unbelievers and to take us up to Himself, but also in our day-to-day -day living between now and the time He comes again, or you know, whether He comes for the second coming or comes to take us home to be with Him. So this evening, I want us to consider four things um, that have to do with this exhortation. First of all, what it means to encourage and to build up one another. Secondly, why we should build up and encourage one another. Uh, thirdly, uh, when we should be doing this. And, and then finally, how to do this. And believe me, this is a huge subject, so we're not going to exhaust any of these, but hopefully we'll get a sense. 
and some encouragement to be able to do what it is that the Lord is calling us to do here through the Apostle Paul. So first of all, what is Paul talking about here? And uh, when we use these words, I mean, they have meaning. We understand something of their meaning. We understand what it means to encourage. We understand something of what it means to build up. But sometimes it is helpful to look at synonyms. You know, sometimes we look at synonyms to get sort of different perspectives on these words to get a fuller picture. And I think as we look at some of them, it, it helps give us perhaps a, a fuller picture, a fuller or view of what the Lord is really wanting us to do. So to encourage, first of all, means to support, to give support to someone, to instill confidence in them, or to give them hope. And that, I think, is the primary meaning that Paul was referring to when he says, you know, we don't grieve as others, the Lord's going to come, uh, therefore comfort one another with these words. The word comfort there is the same word that, from which we get the word encouragement, but there it has the particular meaning of supporting and giving hope. But it can also mean something else. It can mean, uh, let me give you a list here and you'll get an idea, to hearten somebody, to cheer them, to lift them up, to inspire them, to motivate them, to spur them on, to fire them up, stimulate them to love and good deeds, invigorate, vitalize, revitalize, embolden, fortify, rally. Kind of gives you a little bit more of a sense of what Paul is talking about. And then when he uses the word to build up, it has a similar meaning and a similar purpose. It means essentially to increase a person's ability, his potential or her potential, to do something, to strengthen them, to better equip them. Uh, that's what building up is. We see it in, translated in different ways, the word edify. You know, building an edifice. You know, it's make, you know, building a building. It's building something up. And uh, to build up or to edify essentially means the same thing. It means to strengthen somebody's ability to do what it is the Lord has called us to do. And you can see how these two things will very easily work together. Paul tells us that we are to support one another, strengthen each other's hope in the Lord, motivate each other to put our trust in the Lord, to trust Him in all things, uh, to help each other to be better able to do what our Lord actually calls us to do. So that's what Paul is telling Thessalonians they ought to be doing and what the Spirit of God is encouraging us and telling us that we need to be doing for one another this evening. Now, secondly, why should we do this? And, of course, there's always the obvious reason, which is that's what the Lord tells us, that He wants us to do, which is what we just read. Now, we saw this morning that when somebody falls asleep in the Lord Jesus Christ, that we should try to bring encouragement. We should try to bring comfort. That's the reason why we're dealing with that topic this morning, because uh, we have lost a dear one. I mean, not really lost, but he's been taken from us for a short time, fallen asleep in Jesus, and comfort is needed. And so that's why Paul was seeking to comfort the Thessalonians in the same way. Don't worry, he says, that... Those who are already asleep in the Lord Jesus are going to miss when he comes again because they're actually going to beat you there, okay? So comfort one another with those words. And that's essentially what he says. And I'll just read that last verse again because this is what our, was our meditation. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. But this is something that the Scripture tells us that we should be doing in other circumstances as well, not just in that one area. Paul writes uh, to the Romans in Romans 14, 19, So then let us pursue the things which make for peace and the building up of one another. He writes in chapter 15, verses 1 and 2, Now we who are strong ought to bear the weaknesses of those without strength, and not just please ourselves. Each of us is to please his neighbor for his good to his edification. Now again, the tendency I think in, well, in humanity, in human nature, and certainly in our society, and we find even within ourselves, is to think only about ourselves. But he says, let's not just please ourselves, 
but we are to please our neighbor for his good and to his edification. Think about how to build them up. In this particular context, don't use your food, your liberties in Jesus to tear down, but rather use your liberty or perhaps set it aside in order to build up your neighbor. And then in 1 Corinthians 10, verses 23 through 24, something similar where he's talking about meat offered to idols and things of that nature. He says all things are lawful, but not all things are profitable. And by the way, when he says all things are lawful, he's not saying anything goes. You can do whatever you want to. There's no law. There's no, no commandment, no standard. So sin as much as you want to. Don't let anybody tell you you can't do that. But he's basically saying you have liberty to eat perhaps food offered to idols, but it may not necessarily be a profitable thing for you to do that. All things may be lawful to you with regard to foods, but not all things are going to edify. They're not going to build up your neighbor. Let no one seek his own good, but that of his neighbor. So we need to think not only about ourselves, we need to be thinking about others how we can edify them, how we can build them up, how we can encourage them. Now, if we wanted to find the perfect example of how to do this, uh, to whom would we, would we look? But the Lord Jesus Christ, He is the perfect example. Now, it's true that Jesus had some very strong words to say to those who consistently proved to be His enemies. That's true. But he persistently loved, encouraged, and built his disciples up. And even when he had to rebuke them and reprove them for their sins, which he did on one occasion with Peter. Remember, Peter says, Lord, you're not going to go to Jerusalem. That's not going to happen to you. And he says, get behind me, Satan. But we have to assume that even when he did that, he did that because he loved Peter. He did that for his good. And he didn't do it to tear him down, but rather to build him up. Jesus was always building the disciples up. And by the way, if anybody could have seen all the flaws in individuals, Jesus certainly could. And he could have pointed every one of them out and he could have stood over them and criticized them endlessly and torn them to pieces. But that's not what he did. Jesus built them up so that they would be able to do the work he was calling them to do. Now, this is what he wants us to do. This so is what he calls us to do. He wants us uh, to follow the example that Jesus gave us. And let's also not forget that whenever the Lord commands something, it, it always has a good purpose behind it. He always has a good reason, and he certainly has one here. We need this. We need encouragement. We need to be built up. We can't do it on our own. We're crippled without one another. This is one of the reasons why the Lord put us together as a body, why we're a family, why He's given us the gifts that He's given to us, because of the ministry that each of us brings, which each of us need. That's the reason why we have the makeup that we have here and why the Lord brought uh, you together and all of us together here, because He knew we needed each other. Uh, Paul tells us about this in his uh, writing to the Ephesians, and oftentimes we, we look at, at chapter 4, verses 11 through 16, and somehow only seem to see the first part of it. It talks about the particular gifted offices that he gives in the church, but he goes on to talk about how we need every part of the body to be doing what it is he's put them there to do and gifted them there to do so that the whole body can actually grow together. So let's read that. Ephesians 4, 11 through 16. And he gave some as apostles and some as prophets and some as evangelists and some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. As a result, we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness in deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body, being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. 
Each part of the body is important. And again, remember, we're not literally a body, so the, the work we're doing is not you know, literally what, what the parts of our bodies are doing, but it's an analogy to remind us how we need one another and how we need each other's gifts and how we need to be ministering those gifts to one another to build up one another, uh, to build up this body. So each of us has a particular function in the body of Christ so that collectively we might do what the Lord has actually called us to do. Uh, think of a couple of analogies that our Lord Jesus Christ uses. He, he says that we are to be lights in this world, which means that we are to shine the light of the gospel of his truth to others so they can see and be saved. Well, when we all shine together, where we stand out, as it were, more brightly. So many believers can shine more brightly than simply one believer. We have individual responsibilities. We have corporate responsibilities. We might think of it in, in these terms. You know, the Lord has lit within each one of us a particular fire. But these fires that we have do burn hotter when they're put together, when we gather together and we worship and express faith and encourage one another. We know that when we begin to grow weak, that is when our fire begins to burn low, we need fuel. We need more fuel. We need fuel that comes from the Lord. We need His Spirit. But we also need what each other supplies. We need exhortation. We need admonishment. We need encouragement. We need to be built up in order that our flame might become strong again. When we face trials, we need strength from our brothers and sisters to be able to face that trial. Maybe they've gone through it and they've come out the other end and they know that there's hope in the Lord and so they can encourage you to do that. We need that encouragement. We certainly, as we've already seen this morning, need comfort from one another when we lose one that is dear to us in the Lord. Now we need to hear again what it is that the Lord says. Even though we already know that He says this, it's comforting to hear it again and to hear it from somebody who actually believes it, that everything is all right, that our loved ones are with the Lord and they are so blessed. So we need each other. We, God did not make us to do what it is we're doing on our own, but He has called us basically together that we might encourage one another. <clears throat> well, thirdly, when should we encourage and build up one another? Well, I think the obvious answer is whenever the Lord gives opportunity, as often as we possibly can, because this is one of the ways the Lord has given to us to help us go in the right direction. Listen to what the author to the Hebrews writes in Hebrews 3, verses 12 through 14. He says, take care, brethren, that there not be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God, but encourage one another day after day as long as it is still called today so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold fast the beginning of our assurance firm until the end. Now, when you really stop and think about what the author to the Hebrews is saying here, what he's saying still applies to us today because he, the, the today that he's talking about means as long as the opportunity still is there to enter into the rest of God, that is, of entering into heaven. We are to encourage one another as long as that opportunity exists. It existed for them back then. He was encouraging them to continue to press on toward heaven, and to do that, you press on towards Christ. Don't go back to the old covenant shadows, even to save your life because of the Roman persecution coming against the Christians. You need to press on towards the Lord Jesus Christ and hold fast to Him until you enter into His rest. Well, that was true of them then, and that's true of us now. We haven't entered that rest yet, so we still need that encouragement to press forward until either the Lord comes or we arrive in glory. By the way, this also gives us another reason why we should encourage one another, why we need it. We might think, and I think we often do think, that the idea of eternal security, which is true, perseverance of the saints, 
God is going to make sure that we persevere to the end. God is going to preserve us. That somehow that works apart from the body of Christ. That somehow it's only the work of, of the Holy Spirit within us to get us to keep holding on. Well, the author to the Hebrews here tells us that it's actually something that, yes, the Spirit's work is important. You can't do it without that. But we also need the Spirit's work in one another to encourage us day after day so that we don't become hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. There are ways by which the Lord keeps us moving forward. There are ways by which He preserves us. There are warnings in Scripture that are meant to strike some fear in our hearts so that we keep moving in the right direction. There are promises in Scripture that, that keep us moving forward because we want those things that are promised. But there's also the people of God bringing those things to us, encouraging us in those things, and spurring us forward. We need one another in order to do this. This is the way the Lord works. By the way, this is also one of the reasons why the Lord actually calls us to meet together for worship rather than just meeting individually in our homes and worshiping by ourselves alone because we need this kind of encouragement. Again, listen to what the author to the Hebrews writes in Hebrews 10, verses 23 through 25. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Now he says that we should consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, and how can we do that? I mean, we can consider it, I suppose, by ourselves, but how can we actually do it unless we assemble together? How can we encourage one another unless we assemble together? And then going back to what we just saw before, that we need to do this day after day, there's the assumption that the body of Christ is going to be interacting also during the week to try to encourage and to try to build up and to try to spur one another on. We need each other, and perhaps more than we often think that we need each other. Now, finally, uh, how can we do this? How can we encourage? How can we build up one another? Well, let me just, first of all, emphasize again how important it is that all of us be involved in doing this, in doing this ministry, in offering or providing this service uh, to one another. Uh, one believer or a handful of believers within a congregation isn't enough. Their zeal isn't enough for, for everyone. We, you know, to keep everybody's fire, as it were, burning around them. Uh, even blazing fires, even those who are zealous for the Lord can actually cool if they aren't refueled by other sources. Or worse, if... if a person's zeal is constantly exposed perhaps to the opposite things, the opposite of the encouragement, the opposite of being built up, to indifference or unbelief or criticism, you know, which we can be guilty of ourselves when our love grows weak. You know what it feels like to be in that kind of environment. You know what it's like to be criticized, and it can be it can be difficult. Now, we do know there's such things as constructive criticism. And that would be the criticism that comes in the way that we're supposed to, but I'm thinking here about the kind that isn't so good where somebody sees you do something wrong and they put their finger on it and say, that was a bad thing, okay? <laughs> Possibly. So what we need to do is we need to make sure that we work on ourselves first, work on making sure that our fire is burning hot, that our zeal is strong so that we can encourage others and not be a source of discouragement to them. Now here I just want to again um, make a bit of a distinction because you know by this fire, this spiritual zeal we're talking about is the fire of God's love. It's the desire for what is, is right and what is good, but it, it is a zeal that is motivated by love, okay? Now, we know that there's different kinds of zeal that are talked about in the Scripture. 
there is a zeal the Pharisees had. You know, Paul said, I, I bear witness to them that they are zealous for the things of the Lord, but not according to knowledge. And I think he would also add, not according to love. The Pharisaical kind of zeal is, is that which the Pharisee had when he went into the temple with the tax gatherer and he looks down his nose at him and he says, God, I thank you that I'm not like this person here. And he points out all the different things that he does that are wrong and how good he is. That's criticism. That's destructive criticism. That's more holy than thou kind of criticism. And that's not the kind that's going to help. It sees only imperfection in others and wants to get rid of it, but doesn't care really what happens to the person so much as long as the offense is, is removed. You know how the Pharisees would pull in their skirts when they would see a Gentile, the skirts of their robes, you know, unclean, and wouldn't associate with them. That obviously is not what the Lord is referring to. That is a zeal, but not the kind of zeal that he wants. We must really want to do good to others as Jesus did. Remember when Jesus was dealing with his disciples, the love was evident, the encouragement was evident, his willingness to do whatever was necessary to help them change was evident. He was the one who would humble himself and become their servant and even lay down his life so that they might become like him because of his love for them. That's the kind of love the Lord wants us to have. That's the kind of zeal that we need in order to inflame zeal in others and to encourage them and, and to build them up. So we need to ask the question, how can we have more of this kind of love? And by the way, it's not just for the body of Christ, but we need to be concerned about those people who are outside the body of Christ as well. Well, we're only going to find it in Jesus. We're not going to find it in ourselves. We don't have the resources, but Jesus does. And in this case, as in every other, we need to look to him. Paul tells us that if we're going to do spiritual warfare, and this is certainly a part of that, we need to be strong in the Lord. We need to be strong in the strength of His might and not in our own because our own is, tends to be more like that of the Pharisee. We need to be filled with the Spirit of God as we're commanded by the Apostle Paul. And let's not forget that the, the primary fruit of the Spirit of God is love. The way we get more of that influence is by using the ways, the means the Lord has given to us. And we've seen those on a number of occasions. We need to be in the Word. We need to be in prayer. We need to be in worship. We need to be under the preaching of the Word because this is one of the ways that the Lord gives us that influence. We need to be participating in the Lord's Supper. We need to make sure we don't grieve the Spirit by doing things we know that He does not want us to do. And that would include every sin. Okay. So be filled with the Spirit. I would suggest cultivating a strong faith, which we will if we're filled with the Spirit, believing. I mean, oftentimes we, we tend to doubt and we don't think about what the Lord thinks about our doubts, that we don't trust Him the way we should. We don't believe His Word the way we should. We need to cultivate a stronger faith, believing that the Lord will do exactly what He said He would do and not doubt Him. Because when we doubt the Lord and we're, we're those doubting Thomases walking around, the people we bump into, we weaken their faith. Instead of encouraging them, instead of strengthening them, we make them weaker. We need to have a strong faith. So cultivate a strong faith. Cultivate a thankful spirit. That's also a very important thing and something that uh, the Lord has been teaching me quite a bit about. You know, learn to see that uh, the glass, you know, is, is half full rather than half empty, you know. See the good things in it. Um, yeah, well, I was just thinking of a personal example years ago where, um, you know, how we can tend to be overly critical and overlook the good things when, uh, when maybe there's like one little flaw that's there. If, if um, you, know, you have a report card, let's say, and maybe you had six classes and you got five A's and you got a B, you know? Should we focus on the B or focus on the A's? We need to see the good things that are there and not focus on the other things. I mean, we can all do that. Again, we just need to make sure that we see things the way we, they are, acknowledge the good things that the Lord is doing, the blessings that, that the Lord gives, the positive things that He's doing, 
rather than looking only at what we believe the Lord hasn't given to us and He's not doing that we think that He should. I think you see the difference. Count your blessings. You've heard that expression before. We need to count our blessings and recognize those and, and acknowledge them. And, you know, we were uh, praying. Uh, I think it was not this morning, although we did pray for this again this morning, but last week, and that the, perhaps the gentleman next door who likes to do the landscaping in the morning wouldn't, you know, make that noise in the morning. And last Sunday, we didn't hear it. And I, think this, I don't think we heard it this morning either. Perhaps a little bit after the service, but, you know, we'd rather he not be working on the Lord's Day, but uh, at least he wasn't distracting us. So we should see that and we should acknowledge God has heard our prayers. God has answered us. We want to be thankful and recognize every blessing that the Lord gives to us. And, and again, that's why we need to be looking for what he's doing and focusing on those things rather than on the things that we think he should be doing but he's not doing Remember, God does what is right all the time, and if he hasn't given us something, it's because it's not good for us to have it at that particular uh, moment. We also need to learn to see the good things in others, that the Lord, what the Lord has done and what he is doing in others, and not just at how we see our neighbor falling short. There's a lot of good things that are there. As I was thinking about that, I was reminded about uh, Barnabas. Remember Barnabas in Scripture? He was, name means son of encouragement. And he was somebody by the things that he did, the sacrifices that he made, he sold property, he gave the money to help meet the needs who were there, uh, of the people who were there, and his examples of love and service were an encouragement to many. But he was also the one who, when everybody saw Paul coming after his conversion and wanted nothing to do with him, for good reason, because he had been persecuting the church and having people put to death, Barnabas was the first one who reached out to him and took hold of him and brought him to the apostles when everybody else wouldn't do it because he was willing to believe the best about him. Now, I realize that, you know, that's a little bit of a precarious situation, but Barnabas, again, showed his love and his concern, even for somebody who was formerly an enemy, and was willing to believe and probably had some evidence that he had been converted and he was the one who took hold of him and brought him in. We need to be that kind of individual. We need to be filled with hope and encouragement before we're going to be able to instill these things in others. And when our faith becomes strong and even as it's growing, we need to use it to help others to strengthen them as well. You know, it's interesting that the Apostle Paul himself needed encouragement from other Christians. As a matter of fact, when he writes to the Romans and he tells them the reason why he wanted to visit them, he said, I want to uh, encourage you, but I also want to be encouraged by your faith. When you're around people that believe, it's very encouraging. He writes in Romans 1, verses 11 and 12, for I long to see you so that I may impart some spiritual gift to you that you may be established. Now, if we stop there, we might think that Paul wanted to lay hands on them and give them various charismatic gifts. But then he goes on to explain what he means. That is, that I may be encouraged together with you while among you, each of us, by the other's faith, both yours and mine. Even the Apostle Paul did not consider himself above the need to be encouraged. And he certainly wanted to use the faith he had also to encourage them. So we need to, as we grow in faith, use that faith to encourage others. We need to make sure that the words we use are encouraging and that they build others up and don't tear them down. I'm reminded of a uh, Cedarmont Kids. Uh, it was a um, uh, these series of videos that were made years ago and uh, all these children singing these Bible songs and so forth. And uh, we played them for the kids a lot. It had a lot of scriptural truth in it. And... You know, we're praying that, that that would, you know, get through. And one of the songs that they um, sang had to do with this, you know, let's build each other up and not tear each other down with, with our words because, you know, children particularly, but, you know, even adults, we can do that. We need to make sure that we use our words properly. Paul writes in Ephesians 4, verse 29, let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification 
according to the need of the moment so that it will give grace to those who hear. Um, you know, it, it, we should sometimes listen to the words that are coming out of our mouths and think about how they might actually strike or, or appear to the people that, that we're talking to because sometimes words come out that we aren't, don't even think about how they're going to affect the other person and how they might be understood and how they might actually be very discouraging. We need to make sure that we're, we're careful with how we speak, as Paul tells us here, so that we'll build them up and not tear them down. When our brothers and our sisters are struggling, when they're discouraged, when they're downcast, we need to also remind them of God's promises. That's essentially what Paul is telling the church at Thessalonica to do, to encourage one another with the promises. In that case, the promise of Christ's return. 1 Thessalonians 4.18, therefore comfort one another with these words but in every other area as well, when we're facing difficulties, think about the promises of God and which ones would bring comfort and encouragement to our brothers and sisters in the Lord. So to sum everything up, we need to be strong in our love for one another and we need to love each other because as Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 8, 1, love edifies. That we know it's love when, when we see its effect on our brethren. It's something that has the tendency to strengthen them rather than to weaken them. And I think you understand what I mean by that. When somebody comes to you and you know whether you know, it's built you up or torn you down, even if it's something that is, you know, somebody's pointing out something you're doing that's wrong, admonishing you, exhorting you. There's a difference between doing it in a critical spirit or doing it in a gracious and loving spirit, knowing that that person loves you and is doing this for your good. So use, you know, love, basically, love will build up. Use your words, but make sure they're mixed with love, seasoned with grace, so that it ministers to those who hear and it doesn't tear them down. May the Lord help us then, basically, to encourage ourselves in the Lord because we need to be the kind of person that can encourage that we may grow in faith and in love so that we might be able to encourage others because we need each other so that together we may all be built up and better able to serve the Lord again think Jesus that was his goal in his disciples was to strengthen them so that they could do what he was calling them to do and we need to be like Jesus uh, to one another. Well, let's, uh, let's bow for a moment of prayer and let's, let's ask the Lord to help us, um, help us do that, to be that kind of person.